Good evening, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and call to order the County of Sacramento. Recording has and... started. Oh, it was just in... interrupted there. Go ahead. Oh, no, that's okay. That is the uh, uh, the canned voice in blue jeans that lets us know that the recording has began. Perfect. Well, bear with me this evening. It's my first meeting as chair. We're going to go ahead and call to order the uh, County Planning Commission for the County of Sacramento for December 6, uh, 2021. Can you go ahead and call the roll, please? Absolutely. Members Borja? Present. Thank you. Uh -huh. Martinson? Here. Tatishi? Here. Wong? Here. And Chairperson Rachel? Here. And we do have a quorum. Perfect. You want to go ahead and kick us off with the opening statement? Absolutely. In compliance with directives of the county, state, and centers for disease control and prevention, this meeting is live stream and close to in-person public participation. Temporary procedures are subject to change pursuant to guidelines related to social distancing and minimizing person-to-person -person contact. To make a verbal comment at today's meeting, dial 916-875-2500 and follow the prompts to be placed in queue for a specific agenda item or off-agenda matter. When the chair opens public comment for a specific agenda item or off-agenda matter, Callers will be transferred from the queue into the meeting to make a verbal comment. Written comments are always accepted. Please feel free to send your email comment to boardclerk at sitecounty.net and your comment will be routed to the board and filed in the record. Thank you, Lydia. And You're did welcome. you want to go ahead and introduce the first item? Item number one, PLNP 2020-00233 is a workshop on Sacramento County Active Transportation Plan. It is countywide, and the environmental document is, is, is that it's uh, not applicable. Perfect. Hello, I'm Nikki McDaniel. Can you all hear me? Yes, Mickey, thank you. Okay. All right, I'm a senior planner at the Department of Transportation. I'm presenting on the draft active transportation plan tonight. I am joined by Kevin Busey, principal civil engineer in the Department of Transportation, as well as Brett Hondorp, president of Alta Planning. Alta Planning is leading our consultant team along with a Civic Thread, which uh, is formerly Walk Sacramento. They are leading our public engagement as well as DK, DKS Associates, who is performing analysis. Getting off in spring 2020, we heard from community, community members across the county about ways that we can make walking and biking safer, easier, and more comfortable for people of all ages and abilities. Now we want to share the draft ATP as a workshop item um, and to hear your thoughts on the draft infrastructure projects and program recommendation. Next slide, please. The active transportation plan is a blueprint for how walkways and bikeways will build out in the, in the unincorporated county into the future. We have four goals of the ATP. One, improve safety for everyone, especially people walking, biking, and rolling. Two, develop more connected bicycle and sidewalk networks. Three, increase access to parks, schools, and other community destinations. Four, make walking, biking, and rolling more comfortable. The plan lists priority infrastructure improvements, which DOT will um, be able to use in order to go after grant funding to then build out that infrastructure. Also, the plan helps, helps the county to have some leverage with private applicants to ask them to build build out these walking and biking facilities within their own applications. Tonight, we want to hear your thoughts on whether on, we want to hear your thoughts on the infrastructure as well as the programming recommendation. Next slide, please. In spring 2020, we kicked off the first phase of public engagement. We wanted to hear about people's current challenges and opportunities in walking and biking. We wanted to know where are people coming from where are they going to and what can we do to improve the trip for how people get to where they want to go in 
we started this, uh, we started a public engagement off uh, co concurrent with the COVID-19 pandemic, which posed a challenge. Civic Thread did a, an, a great job in pivoting to virtual engagement. In the second phase, which is on the second, second part of the slide, the right side of the slide, we took what we heard about people's challenges and opportunities in walking and biking. We rolled that into the analysis that was performed by Alta and DKS, and we formed infrastructure recommendations. We then went back out to the community with a second set of virtual community workshops, pop-up activities, and an interactive map where people could comment on where we were proposed, where we are proposing bike lanes, sidewalks, and that and that kind of infrastructure. We just finished phase three of outreach, which was asking the, the public to comment on the draft plan. The public comment period just ended on November 14th. Next slide, please. We, it, we built upon the stakeholder meetings, which were held early in phase one, and we partnered with a number of community-based organizations to organize these pop-ups. The pop-ups focused on a particular area of the county uh, or a particular demographic. So for example, on December 3rd, 2020, we co-hosted a meeting with AARP and focused on older adults. We used this, we used this strategy to leverage the pre-existing relationships that the community-based organizations already had. Um, and we were able to reach out all the way into people's living rooms. Next slide, please. The result of public engagement and analysis was forming infrastructure recommendations. Here, we're looking at priority sidewalk gaps. This is just a subset of, of the gaps. Um, there are 192 miles of sidewalk gaps that need to be filled in in, in the unincorporated county. For a full listing of all of these gaps, you can look in the plan for the priority ones, and then for the full listing, you can look at the appendices. Next slide, please. We identified 194 priority intersections. Um, these are intersections where we, where we think if we add a pedestrian enhancement, such as a curb extension or bulb out or change uh, the signalization, like add a leading pedestrian interval, um, we can make these intersections better for pedestrians in order to cross the street. The full tables and maps, again, are in the appendices. Next slide, please. Here I am showing examples of intersection and sidewalk improvements. I think we're all familiar with sidewalks and crosswalks, so I'm going to skip to rectangular rapid flashing beacon uh, and pedestrian hybrid beacon up in the upper right. These are, ty these are types of active warning beacons which um, use an irregular flash pattern to indicate to drivers that pedestrians and cyclists have the right of way to cross the street. And that we also have curb extensions leading pedestrian interval to allow a pedestrian to get out into the crosswalk before the light changes for drivers, median refuge island, slip lane removal, which uh, if you're not familiar with that, a slip lane is uh, allows a driver to take a free right uh, and to do so without slowing down very much. And that uh, leaves pedestrians exposed to higher uh, traffic at higher speeds. So if we fill in these slip lanes, we can um, reduce the speed of traffic turning right and also um, free up more space for street furniture or a wider sidewalk. And then we also have no right on red, which we're hoping to reduce right hook collisions by restricting, by restricting drivers to turn right on red. Next slide, please. This is a table and map of priority bike projects Again, the full listing of all of the projects are in are in the plan and in the, in the appendices. We are recommending over 1,200 miles of bikeways. Next slide, please. Here, we're looking at visual examples of bicycle projects. A shared use path, a class one, is similar to uh, the trail in the American River Parkway, 
or the Sacramento Northern Trail. A bike lane is an in-road facility. Buffered bike lane is a, is a bike lane with 18 inches to three feet of, of striping that separates the cyclists in the bike lane from um, traffic that is adjacent. Bicycle Boulevard, this is taking uh, low volume, like low traffic volume streets, and then uh, using signage and other, other means to give uh, cyclists priority. And then we have uh, the, the newest bikeway, which is a protected bike lane or a, or a cycle track, a class four, which is a bike lane that's protected either with curbing, um, diverters, stand-up diverters like posts. It can be planters. It could even be um, a, a parking lane that separates the cyclists from, from traffic. Next slide, please. The plan doesn't stop at infrastructure. We are also proposing a series of, of programs to support walking and biking. Under, under number one, education programs, bike education, uh, we want to teach people to ride safely. We also want to have driver awareness programs. This is a big priority for our SACBAC, the Sacramento County Bicycle Advisory Committee. They want to see programs like the advertising campaign that Caltrans launched uh, for, um, you may have seen the billboards while driving down the freeway. Um, it's a picture of a construction worker and a kid and the, the message is, uh, slow down, my dad works here. Number two, encouragement programs. Uh, the, plan, the plan proposes social walking and biking walking groups. Next slide, please. We recommended infrastructure support programs, classes such as classes such as bike maintenance and repair, bike match program. Saba, the Sacramento Area Bicycle Advocates, has this kind of program where they take donated bicycles and match them uh, with an essential worker, giving that giving that bike to that person for free. Bike maps and safety information, uh, including wayfinding signage. Next slide, please. The fourth category of programming recommendations are is safe routes to school programs, which include walking school buses and bike trains, as well as safe passage and corner graders. Next slide, please. We have support programs. These are more infrastructure support support programs such as bike rack installation, bike share and micromobility, and slow streets and school streets. Next slide, please. This is the project schedule. Right now, we are in stage four. We are reviewing the draft plan, and we are also at the same time um, starting off the environmental document, which is in stage five. So. The, the SACBAC has reviewed the draft plan on November 3rd. They asked about outreach to non-English speaking communities. They wanted to see that we had a commitment, that DOT has a commitment to maintenance, specifically sweeping the bicycle lanes. They expressed a concern about the designation of study corridors, which are which are segments of streets that will be studied for class four cycle track feasibility, but doesn't commit to, to implementing them. It just, um, we need to study it first and then go forward with implementation. Um, they were also concerned about um, parallel cuts in the bicycle lane due to development activity. And they asked that the plan um, show a commitment to Re, uh, restoring bike lanes to their former condition after development activity. And lastly, the SACBAC wanted to see an emphasis in programs on driver awareness and micromobility. The input from the commission that we've received tonight will be forwarded to Alta in order to uh, make changes to the plan and will also be forwarded to the Board of Supervisors on February 15th. Our Caltrans grant deadline is February 28th, and 
As I mentioned earlier, the environmental document is underway now. Planning and Environmental Review is seeking an, an initial study mitigated negative declaration. Public circulation of the document is expected in March and fi the final document should be ready in June. The, the draft plan will go as a for final approval uh, by this commission in August 2022 and then will go before the Board of Supervisors in October 2022. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Commissioners, any questions? This is Kara. Um, I have one. Um, thank you for your presentation. A lot of good work put into this plan. I'm just curious, and this, it might not get down. I didn't see it kind of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, get down into this level of detail, but wondering if this came up kind of through the public outreach project. Um, as you know, the unincorporated area in Sac County is highly urbanized, but there's also, I think, a strong um, kind of community connection to that feeling of unincorporated, um, but obviously sidewalks and connectivity and, and pedestrian safety are extremely important. Is there um, thoughts or was there discussion about how to kind of preserve that quote unquote rural still nature without the sidewalks, but well, but including um, including them, but maybe in sort of a more, I guess it's more of a design function than anything else. But just curious if, if that if that discussion took place or if that came up kind of during that the outreach process. Hmm. So outside of the ATP process, I have Definitely heard from um, from residents in like the Carmichael Fair Oaks area about with concern about adding sidewalks um, mm -hmm. in in order to preserve community character. But mm -hmm. within the last year and a half, I would say that I haven't I haven't seen a lot of comments that speak to that particular concern. So it's more what I've heard much more of is we want to see parity between pedestrians and cyclists, and mm -hmm. we we want to see more sidewalks. So I didn't um, I I didn't hear a lot of that particular comment to be honest. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, it just it does come up sort of more on a project by project basis when we you know, hear from folks and, um, you know, review proposals, but just curious if that um, doesn't sound like it kind of came up in this context. It didn't, and we did manage to have a, have a pop-up with the Delta community, which was, which mm -hmm. was very difficult. And um, there, the, there were only three people, I believe, who were able to make it to that one, but their concerns were more, um, like how do we make it to the nearest major destination within our community rather mm -hmm. than um, like how do we preserve like the rural nature of this area because you know not a whole lot um, not a whole lot of facilities were proposed for that area so it's more like we want to mm -hmm. be able to cross the street and walk along a street um, safely because there are mm -hmm. very high speeds down there. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have, uh, does anybody else have any questions? Hi, this is Commissioner Borja. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and for uh, your hard work on the outreach and for including um, Saba, Walk Sacramento and all the other stakeholders. Um, just curious to see how does ATP would uh, basically discuss the county's priorities of actually delivering projects that would be fiscally constrained. So not a wish list, but an actual project list to which the county is going to be dedicating um, transportation dollars. How are you all going to prioritize which corridors would have um, sidewalks or bike lanes first? Would that be based on the number of accidents, the number of angel or ghost bikes that are tied on those corners? Or would it be which, you know, 
which supervisory district may or may not have a matching like fund for it. Just curious to see how you guys would prioritize which projects would be delivered first. Okay, so that's a good question. So we have a prioritization metric. Uh, the methodology is is listed in in the plan, and then um, so what we did was we looked at the community um, the connections between uh, destinations, um, and we took all of the recommendations and we um, scored them based on the, the metrics. So it included, um, is, it, is this located um, on a high injury network? So you'll see in the plan that we have um, a high injury network for, for bicycles and for pedestrians. And so these are areas where we have seen a lot of collisions. And so you know the presence of a recommendation on one of those on one of those corridors means that we will we would be hitting the the streets that have had uh, the most prior collisions. So that's one way we address that that concern. Um, we have um, one of the metrics is equity, and so if it the if a project was in a um, an environmental justice community, then it received a, a higher score. And then we also have um, uh, under feasibility, there was um, if a particular uh, recommendation received a comment from someone during the ATP process that in, in a positive way, then we uh, it got um, some points for feasibility as in it's receiving community support. So all of the, the recommendations were scored and they were also given a, a project estimate. And so what Alta did then is to take those recommendations to pull out what they consider to be the priority network. Um, and that's what you see in the plan. It's like a subset of, of all of the recommendations, um, just letting, letting us as the county know what makes sense to go after first. Um, and then all of the recommendations are then listed in ranked order in the appendices. And so uh, what we will be doing is at DOT is trying to go after grant funding using this list in, well, we were looking at it in order. However, we are we have to look at the Venn diagram, like the center of the Venn diagram between what the statutory priorities of individual grant programs are and um, what we have on our list. So we won't necessarily go directly one down the list, um, but we will try our best to go for um, the projects that are ranked most highly by our, um, by our metrics, which was our community scoring, um, and then find what funders will, will go for. D does that answer your question? Yeah, th thank you. Uh, I did have one small um, kind of follow up and, and, and thank you for that. I appreciate the Venn diagram and your list of priorities. And also thank you for having a lot of different pop ups in, in different communities. You know, I saw that you guys had a pop up that was uh, uh, with the Farm Bureau. You also had a pop up with a Spanish speaking community and with the SACOG youth. So thank you for uh, thinking outside of the box. Um, my, my question too is, for new developments, would this ATP then require a certain complete streets metric for new and planned developments? Or would new developments then be just um, kind of subject to um, just what was agreed upon by the county? So um, we're going to be looking at potentially new suburban growth. Um, I'd, I'd like to make sure that we are also incorporating complete streets in the design and also in the design manual for what is going to be paid for by those building fees. So the plan gives gives the county leverage to be able to compel a developer to put what we have in the ATP into their plans. Now, with with a like with a larger area like a specific plan like they the applicant can negotiate to have their own their own bikeway uh their own bikeway plan but we'll have significant uh leverage to be able to ask that what we have in the atp is the minimum 
So I think that we are starting from a much um, a much better basis because we have we already have an idea of what we want to see, and from there we can ask for more. Understood. Would would that be incorporating interconnectivity, and not necessarily just like a a circular parkway? Then you just create a bike island. Like I'm trying to see like if, for example, if um, there's gaps in the system, would that incentive for the new developer then uh, work with the county and try to connect, as opposed to saying, "Hey, we have 1.2 miles of walkway within, let's say." inside of our development, for example, but not necessarily connected because it's, like I said, it's, it's not connected. So I think, okay, let me know if I, I'm not understanding the question correctly, but I'll, I'll give an example. So there are two plan areas in the Jackson corridor where it, you know, in talking to the developer, and this is from my time um, at a, at a previous department, um, I think that as as department staff you encourage you encourage uh the bikeway exhibits to meet up so that they're all connecting um and you have more say over the ones that are that that are um going to allow people to enter and exit their particular plan area but are you are you asking whether um like whether developers um, can basically get away with um, not connecting to another plan area? I, I think I'm, I might be missing the. Oh, no, I think the, you answered you, you answer my question. And, and okay. not to say that they're getting away with with anything. I, we wouldn't want to um, you know, imply that they, they're doing something un, unrightly, but it's more so, for example, you did give the Jackson Corridor, you know, the example or the 16, um, Will will they be then incentivized to connect with that, knowing that you know a different county is also trying to take ownership of, of that section? But if if a new community in in those outlying areas, and we want to be able to connect those communities with just having um, a class one or a class two, for example, like what if that that's what I'm trying to ask. I see. I that, see. Yeah. So so I think that you know we did our best with what developments we are familiar with now and you know granted they're all at different stages uh, of going through their entitlements um and so you 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 will see the you'll see the most information about the the plan areas that already have their environmental documents but then you'll see very little about ones that are still going through the process so we will work with the developers to ask for a bikeway exhibit that shows us that we are bikeway and sidewalks um, that will meet up with the existing or proposed infrastructure outside of their area. And then we will also be looking to amend the plan as time goes on so that we will, I mean, we, we can't have imagined every connection that will happen into the future, but we will be able to continue to amend to make sure that we have maintain connectivity. Thank you for that. And and forgive me, Chair Rathel, just one last question. Um, in, in some of the areas that I represent in, in, in District 5, some of our bikeways have now been impacted by, um, I don't want to say encampments, but there are a number of, I, I think, unhoused folks that have uh, rather large numbers of properties that are making it difficult for both pedestrians and, and cyclists to kind of cross through. How is that at all, you know, something that brought, was brought up to the, to, um, to the network or to the, to the workshop? And so how would the uh, kind of active transportation plan kind of also deal with uh, potential hazards on the road um, that might, might include those that are, might be unhoused? So our, let's see, our hope that is that in general that bringing uh, class one trails out um, and increasing the amount of trails will help with other with all users being able to inhabit that space 
right? So yes, you will have people who are unhoused, who have nowhere else to go, but you will also have recreational riders. You'll have people walking, um, people even using it for, for getting to work. And so our, our hope is that with more eyes on the street, that those spaces will be activated um, and that they won't be um, as hospitable to people wanting to just um, set up camp and stay there because there, there will be a lot of people walking through and you, you, you want, if you are living somewhere, you want to be somewhere where you have some, you know, some amount of privacy and um, be able to do what you want to do. So um, did that come up a lot in the, um, in the, in the public engagement? I didn't hear a lot. I did hear some comments um, with that concern. Um, there were more uh, written comments, I think, on that subject. Um, but um, again, we're not, this is a, a public area um, that everyone can enjoy. And so we're trying to find ways to make it so that everyone can enjoy these spaces. Okay, thank you so much, and I appreciate your hard work on this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Borja. Uh, other questions from commissioners this evening? And I'll, I'll sum it up and say I've, I've reviewed the um, active transportation plan, and I just really appreciate all the hard work um, that went into it um, and really trying to to prioritize, um, obviously, we have limited funds available uh, in order to focus on these improvements, but I think they are really important improvements. So I appreciate all of the outreach to the community um, and the the hard look at you know what projects need to go first um, from a safety concerns um, or safety incidents. Um, up to, you know, what, what gets us the biggest bang for our buck with getting folks out of their cars and able to go to points of community interest. So, uh, just want to commend you and, and um, thank you for this presentation tonight, because uh, I, I feel like it's definitely a great document uh, to have out there. And um, that's all I have to say on it. Do we have any action on this tonight uh, or is it just uh, informational only? We're, we're bringing this as a workshop item to take any comments that you have, um, any changes you want to see in the draft plan. Um, and we're coming back uh, for action from this commission in um, in August of next year. Perfect. I think that's all of the uh, commissioner comments. Do we want to open it up for public comment this evening? Do we have public comment for this item this evening? No, there are no public comments at this time. All right, with that, we will close uh, this item out then. We'll close the public comment. And if there's no further comments from commissioners, I'm going to go ahead and close item number one. Thank you very much. And go ahead and announce um, item number two this evening. Okay, item number two is PLNP 2020-00138. Um, which is a use permit amendment, special development permit and design review located at 8010 Orchard Loop Lane in the South Sacramento community. Um, and the environmental doc is exempt. Good evening, Chair Rathel, members of the commission. This is David Ulrey, associate planner, the project planner for the 7-Eleven at Orchard Loop Lane uh, project. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, David, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Okay, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so the project's located at 8010 Orchard Loop Lane at the southwest corner of Calvine Road and Orchard Loop Lane within the South Sacramento community. Uh, so existing conditions, the site is currently developed with an auto service station, convenience store, and a car wash with uh, retail to the north and auto uses to the uh, west, east, and south. Next slide, please. So the uh, subject parcel is zoned general commercial uh, with uh, SC shopping center zoning to the north, uh, light commercial to the east, and GC to the south and west. 
Next slide, please. So some site history, uh, the original use permit for the uh, service station and car wash uh, was approved in uh, May of 1996, and that allowed for uh, operation of the car wash between 6 a.m. and 11 p.m., as well as the 24-hour operation of the convenience store. Uh, the uh, site was uh, finished construction in 2000, and here we have a uh, photo, aerial photo of the site from 2003. Um, it is important to note that uh, the site was recently rezoned concurrently with the uh, Calvine Road Highway 99 SPA rescission um, to its present uh, general commercial zoning. Next slide, please. So um, as previously stated, the request is a use permit amendment for a 590 square foot addition uh, to the service station convenience store, the relocation of the trash enclosure and addition of landscaping, as well as a special development permit to allow uh, greater than 125 square feet of signage for auto service stations. Uh, the project proposes 225 square feet. Um, it also proposes a design review to determine substantial compliance with the Sacramento County countywide design guidelines. Next slide, please. Uh, so here we have the site plan. So it's a little difficult to see, but they're showing their demo plan. Um, and where the existing uh, trash enclosure is, is the area of the addition to the convenience store. And the uh, trash enclosure is going to be moved to the uh, kind of eastern side of the car wash exit. Um, it's also important to note that they are uh, proposing some additional uh, landscape planters, uh, finger planters in the parking lot on that first row of parking. Next slide, please. So here's the landscape plan in a little bit more detail. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so elevations, there's a, there's actually a few of these, so we'll go through them fairly quickly. But um, the applicant team did work with the design review administrator to enhance articulation on the existing building and the area of addition. Uh, new awnings and uh, framing, as well as insets, were added to the existing convenience store. Next slide, please. Um, as well as uh, green screen to the rear of the building. Next slide, please. Um, here's the side north elevation. Next slide. And here we have the car wash. So uh, they did add this two-tone paint scheme as well to um, increase articulation. Next slide, please. And if we could go to the next slide. Here's the rear of the uh, car wash. And next slide. And if we could go to the next slide. So here's a 3D perspective, um, kind of aerial of the site, uh, depicting the addition. Um, once again, the area of addition is at the uh, kind of right-hand corner of the, um, the uh, existing convenience store here where that frame is shown. And next slide. So advisory recommendations. Uh, the South Sacramento CPAC did meet on uh, July 21st and recommends that the Board of Supervisors approve the requested entitlements. The Design Review Advisory Committee also did meet um, in May of 2021 and recommends that the board uh, find the project in substantial compliance with the, the, the countywide design guidelines. Next slide, please. So project analysis, the project uh, is consistent with surrounding auto-oriented land uses. Uh, there are several uh, auto service stations in the vicinity. Um, it's consistent with the policies of the general plan as further detailed in table two of the staff report. It will comply with all applicable use standards for auto service stations and convenience store. Uh, all required findings of uh, the zoning code for the granting of a conditional use permit can be uh, made as detailed in table three of the staff report, as well as all required findings uh, for the granting of a special development permit as detailed in table four. Uh, no 
concerns have been raised by the uh, commenting agencies or departments regarding the viability of the project, and uh, no concerns have been uh, raised by the public at this point. Uh, next slide, please. So some key conditions. Uh, condition 25, landscape will be required to be installed per the uh, prior approved plans, including the replacement of any existing deficiencies, um, with the exception that uh, the area that's being removed by the new um, addition uh, will be made up elsewhere, elsewhere on the site. Uh, condition 27, a minimum of 15% of shelving space uh, will be required to be reserved for healthy foods as defined by the uh, Department of Public Health. Uh, this is actually an uh, EJ uh, implementation measure from the EJ element. And then conditions 39 to 59 are subtype conditions related to convenience stores from the Sheriff's Office. And next slide, please. Uh, so staff's recommendations, uh, staff recommends that the Planning Commission make the following recommendations to the board. Uh, recognize the exempt status of the request under Section 15301, uh, Class 1 of CEQA. Approve the use permit subject to findings and conditions. Approve the special development permit subject to findings and conditions. And find the project in substantial compliance with the countywide design guidelines. And next slide, please. So that concludes my uh, presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions, and the applicant is also in attendance. Thank you so much. Uh, questions for staff this evening, commissioners? All right, hearing none, I'll ask the applicant if they'd like to make a statement. And we do see Mr. Mahoney on the line. And Mr. Mahoney, if you'd like to make a statement, I need to get you sworn in. Uh, sure, it'll be brief. Okay, so if you wish to address the commission, I um, please raise your right hand and the appropriate response is I do. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give this commission is the truth? So help you God, if you do not swear, do you so affirm? I do. Okay, um, before you make your comments, please state your name for the record and make the statement I have been sworn. My name is Nathan Mahoney and I have been sworn. Thank you, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Planning Commissioners, for being here. I just have a brief statement here. I'm the uh, third party consultant project manager for 7 Eleven. Um, but we've worked through this project and think it's a, it's a great opportunity to expand this building and just offer. Uh, a little more selection to the community. This is um, on relatively the absolute small side of existing convenience stores. Um, I work on quite a few with 7-Eleven um, and typically the minimum is 3,000 square feet. Even with the, the expansion, we're not getting quite up there. Um, so they're just proposing popping this out a little bit to provide some additional space to, to get some of their newer equipment in there and um, sell a wider variety of products, which do include those healthy foods, um, as mentioned and it, as is required. That's really all I, all I have. Um, other than that, I think it's a straightforward project. And if anyone has questions to ask, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahoney. Any questions for the applicant this evening, commissioners? All right, hearing none, we're going to go ahead and open up for public comment. And do we have any commenters on the line this evening, Lydia? And we don't. There are no public commenters in the queue. Can we go ahead and close that queue? All right, and we'll be closed for public comment. Um, commissioners, uh, any deliberation or a motion? I'm happy to move the staff recommendation. This is Kara. Uh, second, this is Joe Phil. <clears throat> All right. Any, any further discussion before I call for a vote, commissioners? All right, go ahead and call the roll, please. Okay, uh, commissioners Borja. Yes. Commissioner Borja. Uh, yes. Thank yes. you. M Martinson. Yes. Tatishi. Yes. Wong? Yes. And Chair Rachel? Yes. 
and the motion passes unanimously. And that'll conclude item number two. Go ahead and move us on to item number three, please. Item number three is PLNP 2021-00033. It's a general plan amendment, community plan amendment, rezone, special development permit, and design review located at 1330 Elkhorn Boulevard at the southwest corner of the Elkhorn Boulevard and 14th Street intersections in the Rio Linda, Alberta community, and the environmental, environmental dock is exempt. Okay, <clears throat> good, good evening, commissioners. This is Jessica Brandt. I'm your um, project manager for this item. Uh, we also have the applicant here, Hank Berga. I believe he's um, on video as well. And we have his representative, um, Nick Abdus. So this is the Hickory Hanks Barbecue Rezone Project. Next slide, please. So as stated, uh, this uh, site is on Elkhorn Boulevard at the southwest corner of Elkhorn and 14th Street in the Rio Linda, Alberta community. This is a, a, a large, long request for a, a rather small project. So the request includes general plan amendment, community plan amendment, a rezone, special development permit, and a design review. Next slide, please. As you can see here, this is the context of the site. Mm -hmm. uh, the cross hatching shows the site itself. Uh, next slide is a little bit closer in. Yep, there we go. Uh, so this is an aerial photo of the site. Uh, the use of the site is both uh, residential um, for Mr. Verga, as well as the site of the uh, commercial enterprise, um, which is mainly on the northern portion of the site. And that's the area um, that is looking, that we're looking at um, rezoning um, at, at, for a continuation of his business. Next slide. So project detail, um, this because it has the general plan amendment, community plan and rezone, uh, will be going to the board of supervisors for a, a final decision. The request, as I said, is to rezone uh, just a portion of the existing agricultural residential property to commercial. And this is to accommodate continued commercial use on the site. Uh, Mr. Verga has uh, a uh, takeout um, restaurant or takeout food operation on the site. And uh, that is what we're looking to accommodate moving forward here with the commercial rezone. There are no changes to the existing site layout or um, no additional improvements are uh, being requested uh, or, recommend, or recommended at this time. The design review administrator uh, did make a recommendation to find the project in substantial compliance with our design guidelines and the Rio Linda Alberta Community Planning Advisory Council met uh, this summer and recommended the board approve uh, the request as well. Next slide. So this one is hard to read, I apologize, uh, but it effectively is showing on the right hand side that the uh, just the top portion, a little under an acre, is uh, slated to have new general plan, community plan, and zoning designations. So the existing designations, you have um, agricultural <clears throat> residential under our, our general plan, agricultural residential preservation area under the Rio Linda Alberta community plan, and an AR2 or agricultural residential two acre minimum as zoning. The new designations uh, would be commercial and office under the general plan, limited commercial under community and uh, limited commercial under the zoning designation as well. Next slide. <clears throat> More key points. So uh, some history here, the applicant um, owner have, did receive a use permit in 2010 or 2011, excuse me, uh, for a bed and breakfast in a private social center uh, in this northern portion of the site. There were some site improvements that were completed to support these uses. Um, some were not built. Uh, for instance, there was a, an event hall that was a part of that, uh, but was not built. There was a commercial kitchen uh, that was permitted as part of that improvement package. So during the pandemic over the last year and a half, uh, the applicant began selling takeout food from the site. 
And unfortunately, that is not an activity that is permitted in this agra zoning, um, nor was it something that was covered under this use permit. And so after discussions um, with the county, it was determined that uh, the only path forward to legalize uh, this use was to rezone the property um, to uh, commercial designation. Um, and this also, unfortunately, necessitated this general plan and community plan amendment package as well. Next slide. So, as I've said before, they're only requesting a portion of the property um, to be rezoned. We have included a rezone conditioning condition that limits the uses uh, that will be allowed under this new commercial zoning to those existing and approved under the 2010 use permit. Um, this is partially uh, uh, because of um, the need to ensure that the impact of the rezone um, does not increase related to um, the environment and uh, surrounding neighbors. So the, the items, the operations that are there now uh, would be allowed to continue, um, but they could not expand. The community plan amendment does include removing this portion of the site from the agricultural residential protection area overlay. Uh, staff is bringing this forward with a recommendation for approval. And uh, the idea was that uh, for this particular site, um, there are a number of items that are unique um, for this situation and uh, that uh, made such a change um, a reasonable request and it would not necessarily degrade the preservation area overlay. And that also there are other small rural uh, businesses that uh, when that preservation overlay was uh, put in place were not included in the overlay. Um, again, um, acknowledging that they are small uh, rural serving businesses. Um, so that's the community plan amendment um, component. And then uh, with the rezone, uh, that does move the buildings into a commercial designation and they would need to meet our, our uh, development standards for commercial buildings. Um, unfortunately, the way that the site has been um, developed it doesn't meet that, um, doesn't mean that it's, it's bad, it just uh, was built um, within the context of an agricultural residential um, uh, parcel at the time. And so uh, there is a special development permit that has been added to effectively uh, legalize all of the buildings and the site improvements as they sit. Um, again, staff has limited this um, as just pertaining to the buildings at hand. Uh, there would not be the ability to utilize the special development permit for expansions uh, should they be uh, requested. Uh, and then finally, the applicant uh, has also provided some arguments to support uh, the, the compatible use of this commercial area. Uh, the, the use of the property has been ongoing for a number of years and that the continued use in this manner would not cause a negative impact on the surrounding properties. Next slide. So here's the site plan. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, no changes to the building or the site layout would be um, part of this. It would just simply be uh, colors on a map, effectively. Uh, and uh, the access would continue to be from Elkhorn Boulevard. And uh, the operations would continue as they have. Next slide. And so uh, the recommendations, um, these are, uh, it's a bit of a beast here, uh, but we are recommending the Planning Commission take the following action, which is approving a resolution to authorize the amendments to the general plan land use designation of the project site from AGRES to commercial office, subject to findings. And then the second component is recommend, recommending the Planning Commission make the following recommendations to the board and that is recognizing the exempt status of the request under CEQA, approving a resolution authorizing the, an amendment to the general plan land use designation of the project site from agricultural residential to commercial office, again, subject to findings, that they recommend to the board 
that they approve a resolution authorizing an amendment to the Rio Linda Alberta Community Plan land use designation from uh, Ag Res 2 with a preservation area overlay to LC, which is limited commercial. Next, uh, next slide, please. And there's more. Adopt an ordinance authorizing a rezone of the project site from the AR2 zone to the LC zone, uh, subject to findings and the conditions, um, including the condition on restrictions on operations that I had mentioned. Approve the special development permit, uh, which is attached uh, to the package, subject to findings and conditions. And finally, find the project in substantial compliance with the design guidelines, again, subject to findings and conditions. I believe there's one last slide. And this is a view of the site um, from the south, and that completes staff's presentation. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And as I mentioned at the beginning, both the applicant and his representative are also available. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation this evening. Questions for staff this evening, commissioners? All right, hearing none, I'll invite uh, the applicant or the applicant's representative to address the commission this evening. Uh, you'll need to get sworn in first. Okay, well, we have uh, Mr. Vergas sworn in and Mr. Abdis, will you be speaking this evening? Uh, if necessary, yes. Okay, let's go ahead and get you sworn in, please. Okay. Okay, please raise your right hand and the appropriate response is I do. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give this commission is the truth, so help you God? If you do not swear, do you so affirm? Yeah, I do. Okay, and please state your name for the record and make the statement I have been sworn. Yeah, this is Nick Abdus uh, with the Thomas Law Group. I have been sworn. Thank you, Mr. Abdus. Thank you. I know uh, Mr. Hickory Hank is uh, on the line and would like to make a few remarks, and I'll be available for, uh, for questions uh, afterwards. So thank you again for the opportunity to be before you today. Mr. Hickory, thank you. You have the floor. Yeah. Well, thank you. First, I want to thank the county and, and Jessica for all their hard work and understanding and helping me get through all this difficult times. Uh, as you might think, being a, a restaurateur in some aspects and the catering I've done the last 30 years in a whole outlying area. And what COVID has done to us has just been, you know, pretty much unbelievable. But anyway, all that being said, you know, I'm, the, the reason why we even started the takeout was to help support us through the COVID and just looking to try to move forward and improve things for ourselves and, and keep my staff busy and working. And uh, just hoping that you can see forward that this is something that, that isn't hurting the community at the present time. And I feel the community is behind us and hope to be able to sustain this for many years to come. And that's pretty much my comments at the present moment. Any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thanks, Mr. Verga. Uh, any questions, commissioners, for the applicant this evening? All right, I'm not hearing any questions, Mr. Verga. Mr. Avdis, thanks for being with us this evening. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to public comment. Um, Lydia, do you have a number for how many public commenters we have this evening on the item? And surprisingly, there are no uh, verbal public comments this evening. Well, great. We got a lot of written public comments uh, supporting Mr. Hickory Hank, and we appreciate all those folks that chimed in um, in support. It, it uh, While reading them all, I was really wanting to get down there and have some barbecue. Uh, so I'll, I'll be down there soon to, to give it a try on a Friday. So hopefully you get uh, a lot of new customers for this uh, experience going through. Uh, it looks like a lot of uh, details to work through with the county. All right, uh, commissioners, any uh, further discussion or motion this evening? Hi, this is Commissioner Borja. I'd like to move and, and approve a staff recommendation. This is Commissioner Tatish, I'd like to second. All right, I'll give a moment for commissioners. Uh, is there any further discussion before we call for a vote? 
All right, hearing no further discussion from the commission, will you please call the roll? Absolutely, and um, Chair, I can close this item, uh, public comment queue at this time, if you'd like. Yes, please, thank you. Thank you. And for the roll call vote, Commissioners Borja? Yes. Mortensen? Yes. Tatishi? Yes. Wong? Yes. And Rathel? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Congratulations, Mr. Hickory Hank. <laughs> Thanks for being with us this evening. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you. Thank you all, and I highly appreciate it. Come see me, would you? <laughs> Will do. All right, with that, we're going to move on to item number four this evening. All righty, and item number four is PLNP 2011-00095, for general plan amendments, community plan amendments, zoning ordinance amendments, Jackson Township specific plan adoption, adoption of the public facilities financing plan, adoption of Jackson Township urban services plan, adoption of a water supply master plan amendment, and water supply assessment. Uh, located in the northeast corner of Excelsior Road and Jackson Road in the Cordovan Vineyard Communities and the environmental dock is a recirculated draft environmental impact report. Good evening, commissioners. Todd Smith, principal planner uh, for Sacramento County here presenting this item tonight. Um, next slide, please. So this is the Jackson Township specific plan. Uh, it is one of four uh, major master plans along the Jackson Highway corridor. Uh, the project includes uh, just over 1,390 acres uh, at the northeast corner of Jackson Road and Excelsior Road, just south of Independence at Mather, an existing neighborhood to the north there. Uh, the project is outside of what's known as the Urban Policy Area, or UPA but it's inside the urban services boundary or the USB. And those are two uh, boundaries in the general plan that uh, the county uses uh, with respect to uh, growth management. The project site uh, contains the existing Sacramento Raceway. Um, the project has gone to the Vineyard and Cordova CPACs uh, multiple times and both CPACs have recommended approval of the project. Uh, you, as the Planning Commission, previously heard uh, hearings on the draft EIR and the recirculated draft EIR. Uh, the purpose of tonight's hearing is to receive your recommendation for the Board of Supervisors. Next slide, please. So just to give you a little geographic uh, context, the Jackson Township project is that uh, I'll call it salmon color, uh, right in the middle of the screen there. Uh, to the east, you see in green the Newbridge specific plan that was approved in uh, fall 2020. To the north is the Mather South community master plan approved in January 2020. And then to the west, uh, the proposed West Jackson Highway master plan that is uh, currently going through the process. Jackson Highway runs right down the middle, uh, and on the east boundary is Sunrise Boulevard. The west boundary of the corridor for our planning purposes is Watt Avenue, or South Watt Avenue, excuse me. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to give you a real high-level overview of what the project uh, requests include. Uh, it includes multiple general plan amendments to move the UPA, the urban policy area, uh, amendments to the land use diagram that would reflect the proposed uh, land uses. It would amend the transportation plan uh, to reflect the uh, um, perimeter roadways, Excelsior, Jackson, Kiefer, and the like. And then an amendment to the bicycle master plan, uh, which would show the proposed uh, on and off street trail network. The project also includes community plan amendments for both the Vineyard and Cordova community plans, given that the project uh, lies within both of those communities. And the project uh, does request adoption of the Jackson Township specific plan, the development standards, and the design guidelines that are included in uh, your packet tonight. The project also has a public facilities financing plan 
and an urban services plan, uh, an affordable housing strategy, and a uh, zone 40 water supply master plan amendment and a water supply assessment. And, and the last two, I wanna make note that those are uh, actions that would be taken by the Sacramento County Water Agency Board of Directors. Next slide, please. A uh, little bit of on-site context here. Uh, most of the uh, requested entitlements uh, at this time only apply to applicant-owned properties. Applicant owns about 64% of the plan area. Uh, this graphic uh, on the slide shows the non-participating owners with the, the cross-hatched. The applicant ownership uh, does not have any layer over the top of it. Um, I'm making this point because uh, the county's general plan uh, in our, our growth management criteria, policy LU-119, does require logical planning boundaries uh, for expansion of the urban policy area. And so it's by the county's request uh, to comply with this policy that the applicant has included these non-participating properties within the larger Jackson Township specific plan area. Next slide, please. And so I'm just briefly gonna run through some exhibits to uh, go with all the words I just said. Uh, the urban policy area expansion, um, you can see on this graphic, the existing UPA is the gray color. Uh, it would be with the project, uh, would ex expand to include uh, the Jackson Township plan area. Next slide, please. The general plan land use designations uh, on the left, are what's existing, uh, some extensive industrial um, and some, excuse me, extensive industrial, uh, about 823, give or take acres, and then general ag, about 567 acres, would be uh, redesignated in the general plan land use diagram to reflect the proposed land uses, uh, the mix. Uh, low density, medium density, uh, high density, open space preserves, um, and commercial and mixed use as well, uh, and office. Uh, next slide, please. The transportation plan amendments, um, just to get your bearings here, uh, Jackson Road on the south, Excelsior Road on the west. Uh, these would be redesignated as pre-2030 uh, uh, roadways in the general plan. They're currently designated as post-2030. Um, one thing I want to make mention of on this slide, you can see the um, on Excelsior uh, roadway, it has this uh, left of the Y going to the northwest. That would align with a future Douglas Road bypass that the county is currently uh, going through design on. Um, next slide, please. The bicycle master plan uh, amendments include all of the on-site uh, trail network, uh, both on and off street. Um, I mention, I'll make mention of this because uh, the bicycle master plan is a policy plan that's incorporated into the general plan. And I think Commissioners, in your earlier comments on item one, the active transportation plan, uh, that does supersede or will supersede the bicycle master plan upon its approval uh, later next year. So this uh, exhibit actually shows the, the effort that staff and the applicant have uh, engaged to put forth a robust on-site trail network that connects to the projects to the east, uh, Newbridge, and to the west in the West Jackson plan area, as well as to the north at Independence at Mather. Next slide, please. So here you see the uh, Vineyard and Cordova community plans, respectively. <coughs> um, it's really that north northern triangle piece north of Kiefer Boulevard that's in the Cordova community plan. Um, the rest of the project area is in the vineyard community plan, and all of uh, the project area would be um, a change to show Jackson Township specific plan uh, within both the vineyard and Cordova community plan areas. 
next slide, please. Uh, this exhibit is the proposed land use plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I want to just briefly touch on a few things. Um, what you can see here, uh, the yellows are the low density residential. The oranges are medium density. Uh, browns are high density. And the reds are general commercial. Uh, the purple color is uh, office. And the darker bluish color, kind of central in the project along Jackson Highway, is uh, proposed mixed use. So, uh, the project does include, um, actually, go, go to the next slide. Uh, I'll get into the details here. So the specific plan itself uh, is what would be the, the policy plan that the county would use to um, ensure that future development with the plan within the plan area uh, meets the standards, the policies of the specific plan, as well as the development standards and de design guidelines. Um, they would effectively become uh, the land use regulatory uh, document to guide future development within the plan. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the project itself includes uh, 5,690 dwelling units of varying density, uh, low density all the way up to high density, a uh, little over 2 million square feet of commercial and office space, uh, 408 acres of open space and parks, uh, and that includes almost 260 acres of natural preserve. Uh, the project includes three elementary school sites and one high school middle school site, and, and these were all developed uh, in coordination with Elk Grove Unified School District, who is the, the uh, school district in this area. The open space was coordinated through the South Sac uh, Habitat Conservation Plan team, and the park locations have been coordinated with Cordova Rec and Park District. Project includes uh, a fire station site uh, that uh, would meet uh, SAC Metro Fire District siting criteria uh, to enable appropriate response times. Uh, the project also includes about 74.7 acres in the southeast corner uh, of existing uh, agricultural residential uses. And there's no change proposed to those existing uses. They were simply included uh, at the request of the county uh, to meet that LU-119 logical planning boundary requirement. Next slide, please. So uh, a little more in the details here. Um, the project, uh, and when I say project, I mean alternative two, uh, is consistent with the South Sacramento Habitat Conservation Plan, uh, which has a hardline preserve strategy, uh, as well as avoidance and minimization measures. The land use plan does reflect the hardline preserve strategy uh, as it relates to the site. And the specific plan does include those avoidance and minimization measures. Uh, the project does have a substantial amount of open space. Um, it's got eight uh, active recreation uh, parks consistent with the Cordova Recreation and Park District standards. Uh, it does have an extensive trail network on site that does provide connectivity off-site to adjacent projects. Next slide, please. So alternative two, I um, want to briefly touch on this. Um, the graphic here shows the South Sac HCP preserve strategy, the hardline preserves, and the project area is outlined in red. Um, the CEQA analysis for this project began uh, well before the South Sacramento Habitat Conservation Plan was adopted. Uh, as the project was going through the environmental review process, uh, the county did request that the applicant design uh, a land use alternative that would be consistent with the South Sacramento Habitat Conservation Plan. Uh, and that is alternative two. Uh, it includes a larger uh, on-site wetland preserve, vernal pool preserve. Uh, the South Sac HCP was adopted in 2018, um, and 
<clears throat> it does include, as I mentioned before, the hardline preserve strategy. Um, alternative two was covered in the same level of detail uh, as the original proposed project uh, in the EIR for Jackson Township. And alternative two, alternative two was identified as the alternative environmentally superior alternative, excuse me. Next slide, please. Um, just want to briefly touch on some of the changes that were made in alternative two. On the left was the original proposed project. You can see um, the north and east is where that on-site preserve was originally um, uh, laid out. And on the right, you can see alternative two, that, that large um, uh, kind of bulb area popping out on the preserve that expanded the preserve significantly and reduced the acreage of low density development, or residential development, excuse me. Other changes uh, in alternative two were made in response to community feedback during the early outreach. Um, for example, some of the residents at Independence at Mather to the north uh, recommended uh, switching the community commercial and uh, medium density locations in the northwest corner. So those have been changed in alternative two. Um, the, along the kind of central area just west of the preserve pop out, you can see some of the medium density uh, land use has been slightly reduced from 13 to 10 just in that, um, that area. And then a few other changes um, due to property ownership changes along the way. Uh, for example, in the southeast corner, that low density residential uh, sliver uh, was changed from ag to, it was originally ag, was changed to low density in alternative two. Um, next slide, please. So public facilities and services is a big topic for a specific plan. Uh, the project does include an extension of a trunk sewer line uh, from offsite to the west. Um, it includes an extension of the potable water supply infrastructure that currently exists offsite from the east. Uh, the project includes a drainage master plan that uh, shows how, with the uh, with the project and the future build out, how the onsite drainage uh, can be accommodated uh, to deal with stormwater runoff. Uh, the fire station is included in, in, and schools and parks are all included in the public facilities and services documents. Uh, the project includes uh, a robust transit service um, that I think the applicant is going to touch on in their presentation, but uh, briefly, uh, the transit service that the county staff has advocated for is robust. It complies with general plan policies. Um, in this case, we're talking about 15 minute headways during the peak hour and 30 minute headways during the off peak hour uh, during the week. Uh, the public facilities finances, financing plan and urban services plan uh, go into extensive detail on all the costs uh, for the infrastructure, the facilities, and their ongoing operations and maintenance. Those are included in the staff package. Next slide, please. So environmental review for a project of this magnitude uh, and given the, the topics that uh, we need to address for CEQA purposes, uh, we did a prepare an environmental impact report. Uh, the first, uh, the draft EIR was published in September of 2019, went through the typical public uh, review process, uh, distribution. Uh, the Planning Commission conducted a hearing on the draft EIR in uh, October 2019. Uh, we received 39 comment letters uh, on that draft EIR. Uh, subsequently, uh, the applicant uh, requested preparation of a recirculated draft EIR that would address some of the public comments and clarify and expand on the analysis in the draft EIR. That recirculated draft EIR was published uh, in May of this year, went through the same public review process, and the Planning Commission conducted a hearing on that recirculated draft EIR in June 2021, and we received 15 comment letters. Uh, all of those comment letters 
are have been distributed to you all, um, and they are um, staff is in the process of being uh, or preparing a response to comments that addresses all the comments received, uh, and a final EIR is being prepared. I do want to make some uh, a brief a couple of brief comments about some of those comments. The um, couple of comments. Uh, raised an issue about vehicle miles traveled. Uh, we are doing some additional analysis around that topic, um, and we expect to include that in the final EIR. Uh, another uh, set of comments we received from Amador County Transportation Commission, um, and I bring this one up in particular because uh, they also commented on the adjacent project, uh, Newbridge specific plan. Uh, staff has had a recent meeting with uh, ACTC representatives to discuss those comments. Uh, we are developing some draft language for um, an additional condition of approval to be included in attachment two uh, that deals with reservation of uh, 14 feet of right of way within what is proposed as a 30 foot public utilities and public facilities easement along the north side of Jackson Highway. Uh, those details are currently being worked out uh, via a collaborative conversation with ACTC representatives. Um, next slide, please. So general plan consistency. Um, the staff's analysis shows that the project meets all the criteria of LU120. This is one of those other policies in the general plan dealing with uh, growth management. The project achieves 19 points uh, out of uh, the total available. Uh, and I want to make note here, this is, the project is one of the most dense along the Jackson Highway corridor overall. Um, the public facilities financing plan and urban services plan uh, include all the necessary infrastructure costs and services with appropriate funding mechanisms. The uh, fiscal impact analysis, uh, which is in a, included in your uh, staff report package, demonstrates that there is no negative impact on the general fund uh, or to existing ratepayers. Uh, the project includes uh, habitat avoidance that is consistent with the South Sacramento HCP. Um, the affordable housing strategy, uh, the applicant in this case proposes payment of the affordable housing fee. Uh, that's outlined in the uh, affordable housing ordinance uh, and the sites that are in within the project area, the high density sites uh, could be available for Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Agency to purchase. Uh, just by way of context, uh, the, the projects uh, previously approved uh, to the east, Newbridge and Mather South had a slightly different approach. They um, via their development agreements uh, entered into affordable housing strategy that consisted of fee payment and land dedication, which has been staff's recommendation uh, over the years um, because we have an obligation as the county to meet the requirements to produce affordable housing in large development projects. Having said that, uh, I do wanna make the point that the applicant's affordable housing strategy uh, is legally permissible based on the county's current affordable housing ordinance. And I do recognize that the applicant has agreed uh, to comply with whatever countywide ordinances uh, or programs that may be adopted by the Board of Supervisors in the future. Next slide, please. So um, at this point, um, thanks for sticking with us so far. I wanna to touch on a couple of issues that were raised in the staff report uh, toward the later uh, sections, dealing with the topics on the screen or on this slide. Uh, so the development agreement, infrastructure fee credits, the Sacramento Raceway noise mitigation, and the CRPD uh, development impact fee. So as I mentioned, um, the projects to the east, uh, uh, I'm sorry, before I go there, uh, I wanna make note that um, as the lead agency, staff's responsibility is to inform the public and to inform the, the hearing bodies uh, regarding any potential issues uh, or concerns. And so this is why staff is raising these. Uh, we believed it was important to identify the differences uh, here with Jackson Township due to parity concerns. 
And so the development agreement here, um, development agreements are voluntary uh, agreements between uh, the jurisdiction and an applicant. We did have development agreements with Newbridge and Mather South. However, uh, those were uh, entered into uh, willingly with those applicants. In this case, the applicant has elected not to enter into a development agreement at this time. Um, I mentioned earlier the affordable housing strategy uh, was a part of those DAs. Um, the DAs also included uh, an infill fee. Uh, the infill fee was uh, $1,000 per dwelling unit equivalent. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, at this point, staff has uh, included that infill fee in the draft climate action plan uh, that the commission heard um, several weeks ago. Uh, but I do also want to reemphasize that uh, the applicants not entering into a DA at this time is legally permissible. It is a voluntary agreement. The infrastructure fee credits uh, question, this has to do with um, the fact that the applicant uh, will likely be the one uh, fronting all the cost for that offsite infrastructure from the west and to the east, bringing it to the project in its first phase. Uh, we've had a lot of discussions with uh, the applicant, the Sacramento Area Sewer District, the uh, County Water Agency <clears throat> regarding the um, what the Sewer District uh, Ordinance and the Sac County Water Agency Code can allow at this point with respect to um, requiring subsequent developers to reimburse the initial um, applicant or developer who fronts those cost, costs. Uh, currently, those ordinances do not provide for subsequent develop developers to be required to reimburse initial developers who front those costs. Um, that's just the state of those ordinances and codes at this point. The Sacramento Raceway noise mitigation issue, um, I mentioned earlier that the raceway does exist uh, on the site. <clears throat> it is an existing use within the plan area that creates noise uh, by virtue of all the, the events that are held there. Uh, the CEQA document identified uh, these noise impacts and uh, included feasible mitigation that would reduce or, or deal with that existing noise source if it existed uh, at the time of future development. Uh, so think residential development proximate to that noise source, how we deal with that. Um, we have heard uh, from the raceway owners uh, recently that they are scheduled to close the raceway in November of 2023. Uh, the mitigation measure that is currently uh, in the EIR uh, would not be ap applicable if the raceway was no longer operational. Uh, and then finally, the Cordova Recreation and Park District Park Development Impact Fee. Uh, the County Board of Supervisors uh, has had um, a couple of hearings on this fee program. In fact, it's on the board agenda for tomorrow, uh, but the board has not yet adopted this fee program. Uh, and so the um, project's financing plan includes language that uh, reflects what I've already said. Uh, that is the applicant would participate in that fee program upon its adoption by the board. Um, next slide, please. So outreach, um, projects like this of this magnitude that go on for quite a while uh, have a lot of outreach associated with them. And um, we, the county, conducted outreach through stakeholder meetings, uh, mailed notices to nearby property owners, several public workshops, uh, as well as um, posting new information on our webpage and uh, an email subscription list. Uh, master plans in Sacramento County also have a technical advisory committee, uh, which is uh, which includes all the service providers, the county departments, and the like. Um, county staff also consult with uh, Native American tribes uh, in the area as part of that process. Uh, we had hearing body workshops uh, at both Vineyard and Cordova CPAC over the years, as well as joint workshops on all the Jackson Highway master plans. Uh, in 2013 and 16. Uh, next slide, please. 
So staff's recommendation here uh, is that the Planning Commission recommend approval of the requested entitlements to the board. And that includes uh, general plan amendments, community plan amendment, um, the specific plan development standards and design guidelines for the project, the public facilities financing plan and urban services plan, the uh, zone 40 water supply master plan amendment, uh, and the water supply assessment, and those two would be to the Sacramento County Water Agency Board of Directors. Um, I do want to clarify uh, one thing here, um, just by way of um, conversations I've had recently. Uh, the original project description included um, proposal to rezone uh, the applicant-owned properties. Um, the applicant has elected not to pursue the rezone at this time, uh, but we did have a, a large lot tentative subdivision map that was included uh, in the analysis in the uh, EIR as well. Um, and we included that large lot map uh, as a draft in the staff report package, but I do want to clarify that uh, we are not requesting any action on either uh, the rezone uh, that was originally proposed or the large lot tentative map tonight. Those would be subsequent actions uh, at, at a time where uh, the applicant elects to move forward with those. Uh, next slide, please. Um, staff recommendation, in addition, um, the Planning Commission may offer the board comments they might have on any of those issues that we raised. Um, again, I want to reiterate that the applicant's approach here uh, on these issues is legally permissible. Um, and next slide. I think that's the end of my presentation, so I'll take any questions from the commissioners. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate that detailed uh, presentation. I'm going to open it up to the other commissioners for questions to kick it off. I'm happy to start. Um, this is Kara. <clears throat> Excuse me, I had a bite of food in my mouth. I apologize. <laughs> um, I'm curious, um, and this is um, probably for, well, I don't know um, if you can answer this, but maybe um, staff that's focused more on our uh, affordable housing ordinance in RENA. Um, you know what the thought process is if sort of that's the the wisdom of staff that you need to dedicate um half the land and then fee out the rest um why that isn't part of kind of the overall approach to the ordinance and um if it's just sort of more specific to these master plans or that you know there's um maybe some um thinking of the county that they're going to be, be revising that ordinance? Sure, I can respond to that. Um, right now, the ordinance provides for uh, fee payment uh, as one of the options uh, to comply. There are a couple of other options that include a development agreement. Uh, the decision to uh, commit the county to spending 50% of the fees collected in large projects was made by the board when the uh, current uh, affordable housing ad ordinance was adopted in 2014. Mm -hmm. um, staff does have a program, you may or may not recall, um, in the housing element that um, where staff would reevaluate the efficacy of the ordinance uh, and we are actually having conversations about revisiting that topic, uh, particularly in um, if it's even clarifying what staff's uh, intent is to achieve uh, affordable housing production in these large project areas. Mm -hmm. With respect to staff's um, approach on the blend of land dedication and fee payment, that came out of a, a conversation with SHRA, actually multiple conversations, where um, it can be challenging from their perspective to cite uh, an affordable housing development project within a community that's uh, kind of already uh, uh, progressing with development. And so 
they felt it was uh, beneficial to uh, have sites designated site or sites depending on the scale uh, designated uh, as early as possible in the development process of, an, of a large specific plan and so that's how we uh, collectively came up with the recommendation to blend um, some portion of land dedication uh, and some portion of fee payment <coughs> Okay, so it sounds like it's evolving slightly. I, I mean, I guess I'm just curious, sort of my motivation asking the question is, are, are we finding that it's just more and more difficult to meet our numbers based on sort of the ordinance that's on the books? Um, I don't know that I have all the information to answer that mm -hmm. um, at this point, but certainly the new RENA requirement um, that's in the housing element is very ambitious it's going to be challenging one way or the other regardless of this particular issue yeah for sure hopefully some of the additional funding from the state will help with that um and then my my other comments were sort of about the um uh, area designated as commercial and office but i think i'm going to reserve those for when um, the applicant speaks That's it for now. Thank you, Commissioner Martinson. Uh, other commissioner questions for staff this evening? All right, hearing none right now from other commissioners, I'll throw in a couple. Um, I heard you talk on a number of the um, you know, the Amador County Transportation Commission and their concerns they brought up in their letter. I appreciate that as it marked off one of my questions. Um, one of the other ones was from the city of Jackson, and I'm just curious what staff's view is on the city of Jackson's concerns with confusion over the name and responsive emergency services. Sure. Um, staff's view on that um, is that in the future when there is a development um, happening in Jackson Township. Um, but what we have found through uh, communication with the emergency service providers, whether it's Metro Fire or SAC Sheriff uh, or others, uh, they actually go through a, a list of uh, getting information from, for example, someone who calls 911. Um, they actually go for details like street addresses um, or, or, or landmarks or um, additional details beyond what the project name is uh, at a certain point in time. Uh, we, um, our view is that uh, that process through which the service providers request that detailed information uh, is sufficient uh, through the dispatch uh, process. And we don't think there's the potential for confusion for somebody, uh, an emergency service provider, going to Jackson Township instead of the city of Jackson in Amador County. And do we expect larger signs that say Jackson Township, or do we expect that to be the name of the specific plan, but smaller developments within that will probably go by different names anyway? I would defer to the applicant on that. That's probably likely in their future marketing efforts, but um, at this point, it's just the name of the specific plan itself. Okay, I'll ask the applicant on that. Uh, so with the um, development agreement, I think I'm, I'm clear on that is, is that basically the applicant's approach um, so far is consistent um, with current ordinance. That's correct. The, there is no ordinance of the county that requires an applicant to enter into a development agreement. Uh, de development agreements are, are voluntary. Uh, and so the not paying the infill fee and also not dedicating land is consistent with the current ordinance. That's correct. The, the infill fee um, currently has not been adopted by the board as a countywide uh, requirement. Um, it's just in VAs that are applicable to two other projects. Um, it is in the draft climate action plan, 
uh, but that has not yet been adopted either. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, the park impact fees, um, I understand the impact on the feasibility analysis, um, but at the end of the day, since they are part of the park um, improvement district or maintenance district, they will have to pay the fees at the time um, as approved, right? They don't pay the fees that are in their estimate. It's just an it's just a question of economic feasibility. It's not a, a agreement that they will pay lesser fees. Is that correct? Uh, I think that's correct. I think the presuming that the board adopts the uh, the fee program, um, then the applicant would be subject to that fee program in the future. Okay. Because there's no no development agreement in place, which would protect them from increased fees in the future. That's correct. Uh, so, on, okay, I got that clear then. I'm just going to kind of go through my points and make sure I understand things correctly as there was a lot of information. So the last one I had um, was really the the sewer district. Um, and I'm just trying to understand. So the, the applicant goes out and builds the backbone infrastructure for sewer. Um, in the future, somebody wants to tie into that backbone infrastructure. And if I read the report correctly, it's that instead of reimbursing the costs that the developer has paid, they would pay, they could pay the impact fee to the Sacramento area sewer district instead. And SASD would be required to hook them up. Um, does that mean that SASD would not then turn over those reimbursements to the developer how I, I guess i'm a little confused on on how that would work in actuality they'd be able to connect the infrastructure that they didn't pay for sure there well before i respond um let me clarify a little bit so the for, for sasd they do have sewer ordinance a sewer ordinance that provides for reimbursement agreements uh, and that's the mechanism that um, sasd uses to reimburse uh, the developers who advance fund the necessary infrastructure. So right now, that ordinance does not uh, contain provisions that would require a future developer uh, to purchase credits from the original developer who funded the infrastructure. It would need to go through the, the reimbursement agreement, uh, which are uh, both in the sewer district's ordinance and the county water agency code on a, on a water supply uh, infrastructure. That's how the reimbursement would occur. So right now, as you see it, they still would be required to reimburse the developer, um, but I guess they're not really required. I guess, is there any way that they could hook up to that backbone infrastructure without reimbursement for the developer? You mean a subsequent developer hooking up to sewer? Correct, okay. like non-participating owners right. in this. I'm just, I'm just thinking we've, we've forced the boundaries, which I love. It makes it, makes it, you know, I guess that part of the process makes sense to me. But because we've forced the boundaries to be consistent, now they have to carry non-participating partners. But if they don't get reimbursed for the backbone infrastructure, then it's kind of, it's, it's really harsh on the developer, as there is a significant portion that are non-participating in this. Your plan. Sure. I think the, the mechanism right now to address that would be the reimbursement agreement through SASD, um, where SASD then reimburses the original developer as opposed to a future developer going directly to the original developer. Got it. So they, they the money just then passes through SASD. That's my understanding. Okay. That, that's what I wanted. I was just trying to, to work that out of my head because it sounded like they're just going to have to pay for the connection, right, instead of the entire portion of the backbone. So that that makes a lot more sense to me. I understand that. Um, and then, you know, I guess what happens, I guess I do have one more really, is, is with the raceway. Uh, this is an interesting one. I don't, I don't even know where to start um, on how we have a... <laughs> operating raceway in the county that goes on for years with multiple code violations and yet still operates. It's it's fascinating to me that this this exists in the first place. Um, and I so I understand the applicant's concern 
with the idea that they shouldn't be held to to noise um, issues that's there. What happens if the raceway does not shut down in 2023? Would the applicant then have to mitigate the noise with all of the boundary properties? So in a hypothetical scenario where the raceway continues, um, then that mitigation measure, I think it's um, number seven in the noise chapter of the EIR, uh, would be applicable. Uh, I think it provides for buffers and, and other mechanisms to uh, attenuate noise. Uh, for example, interior noise would be dealt with through uh, construction methods, um, windows and extra insulation, that kind of thing. Um, that's my understanding at this point. I, I don't, I can't speak to whether the raceway would um, close in 2023. I just know that's what the app or the, the raceway owners have indicated to us. And, and do you know the history on why, um, does the county not have authority to close a non-permitted use? I think I'm gonna to defer to county council on this one. Do we have county council on the line this evening? Yeah, this is Bill Burke. Um, the question, if the question, does the county have authority to close a non-permitted use? The answer is yes, the county does have that authority. Now, why that hasn't happened here uh, there are a lot of details that I have not been involved with in. Um, I think there have been kind of interim agreements reached with the owner, my understanding. Um, I don't know all the circumstances of if there's any kind of arguments about grandfathering or or what their defense might be. But um, if I'm going to say if it is a clearly uh, non-conforming use, then yes, the county has authority to uh, open up a code enforcement case to disallow that use. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 a tough one because it's like we we're kind of just carrying this non-resolved issue forward and forward so um, i guess that answers my question but it still leaves me with a lot of other questions um so i'll i'll leave that for now um i can see how the applicant would would not want to pay for mitigation of a non-permitted use that that shouldn't it shouldn't be there so i i guess i'm, I'm struggling with um not having all the details on that i obviously don't want to you know, I don't want to take sides in it. It's just weird that it's just sitting there unresolved. Um, and that's what we're carrying forward when, when we're trying to plan for it. So uh, that's all my questions for staff. Um, I'm going to move on to other commissioners. We have questions for staff. All right. I believe uh, we have an applicant presentation this evening. Yes, uh, good evening, Chair Rathel and commissioners. Um, I think I have to be sworn, is that correct? <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Um, and will any of the other applicant, members of the applicant team be speaking this evening? I know we have a, a, a few of you on board. Um, most likely not, but if they do, then we'll have them sworn at the time. Okay, all right. So if you wish to address the commission, please prepare to be sworn and raise your right hand and the appropriate response is I do. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give this commission is the truth? So help you God. You do not swear, do you so affirm? I do. And please state your name for the record and make the statement I have been sworn. Uh, Jim Wiley and I have been sworn. Thank you, Mr. Wiley. So good evening, Chair Rathel and commissioners. Um, first, I would like to thank Todd Smith for his presentation and the work he's done on this project. And as you can tell, there's been a lot of work on all parts and uh, we have a very good project here before you. Um, I'm 
representing Stokopoulos Investments, and here with me tonight is Angelo G. Stokopoulos and his team, um, so we'll be available to answer any questions. Out at the outset, I'd like to mention two things. One, we are meeting with ACTC to work through their concerns, um, and we had a meeting last week, and we're getting an exhibit put together, and we'll continue to work with them as we go uh, forward with the project. And then two, there's a additional analysis that um, Todd referenced that's being done on the environmental document based upon the comments that we received back in June. Um, at the end of this meeting, if the commission wishes to close the hearing but wait for the additional environmental analysis to make its recommendation, we're fine with that. You know, traditionally, the um, planning commission does not have the um, final EIR before them. So uh, with that, I'm going to get started. Um, next slide, please. So to start my presentation, I'd like to address the larger planning context in which Jackson Township is an integral part, that being the Jackson Highway Corridor. Um, clear County Growth Policy Direction points that Jackson Corridor is set, uh, has been set in motion and is the growth for the next 50 plus years for housing in this uh, community. As you're aware, this corridor consists of four master plan projects. And as you are also aware, two of those projects, Mather South and Newbridge, have already been approved. And these two projects to the east presuppose the two projects to the west, Jackson Township and West Jackson. So for all practical purposes, Jackson Township has already been approved. Why? Because the interrelationship of the four projects. The transportation mitigation strategy was approved by the board and uh, covers how roads, transit, and trails will be developed for all four projects. The schools on Jackson Township include a high school and a middle school, which will serve the two projects to the east. The fire station at Jackson Township is a battalion chief station where um, it will be the main uh, fire station for the corridor. Uh, jobs and retail services are included in the cumulative reduction in greenhouse gas for all of the four projects and the Mather South and Newbridge projects. So you, as you can see, they're very uh, tied together and with approving the first two, it sets in motion the next two. Next slide, please. Um, so that leads us to this slide, which you already saw in Todd's presentation, but why is Jackson Township a greenfield infill project? You have to the east, the city of Rancho Cordova. Then you have the two projects that have improved, been approved, Mather South and Newbridge. You have to the north, the Mather Independence uh, uh, project that's been there for a long time as part of the Air, uh, Mather Air Force. And then to the west, you have the pending West Jackson project and the city of Sacramento. And I would just indicate that West Jackson Highway was kind of skipped over in the last 30 years for development, primarily because of the Mather Air Force Base, and then secondarily because of the um, mining operations along the corridor. Next slide, please. So what is being changed in the general plan uh, for a, from a land use perspective? First, the urban policy area, area which um, Todd walked through. And then second, and please, next slide. Uh, we are taking 823 acres of urban designated land, extensive industrial, and 491 acres of general ag and converting them to 804 acres of housing and jobs and 510 acres of public use and open space, that's schools, 
uh, green belt, uh, the natural preserve. And then there's about 77 acres that will remain in general ag. Um, next slide, please. So why is this project so important? Well, first, as we just discussed, Jackson Township is part of a whole, the Jackson Corridor. And second, and more importantly, because we have two serious issues facing the county and really the state, if not the world. And those issues are a need for housing and the need to address climate change, or in other words, reduce greenhouse gas. Jackson Township addresses both. Next slide, please. So first, with regard to meeting our housing need, um, as many of you are aware, that especially if you have children that are um, coming uh, into their 20s, uh, this is the largest generation that in the history of the U.S., and it's going to hit the housing market. Well, it is hitting the market right now. So Jackson Township provides 5,690 units and is well designed with an average density of 10.6 units per acre. It also has 36% of it in high density, which exceeds the county um, arena requirements, which is only 33.6. It is the most dense of the four projects along the corridor. Next slide, please. So this exhibit is kind of repetitive. It just depicts the mix of the types of housings, the, their acreage and the average density. And again, the key numbers are 10.6 average density, 5,690 units and 36% um, high density. Next slide, please. And since Todd ran through this and went through what all the colors are, I will not do that for you. Um, just indicate that the higher densities are located near jobs and retail, um, as well as along the major road corridors and the mixed use in particular is in the town center along Jackson. Way. Next slide, please. This slide uh, depicts visually the mix of housing types. Again, low density, medium density, high density, and mixed use. Uh, Jackson Township accordingly provides for a range of housing as part of the Jackson Corridor, helping the county to meet its housing need. Next slide, please. So now back to the other issue, climate change, or really greenhouse gas reduction. As everyone is aware, and you are in, are in particular, as you recently heard, the county's climate action plan, we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Jackson Township does this through the following means, location, mark growth design, enhanced transit program and TMA program, and reduction measures. So let me walk through those um, individually. Next slide, please. Again, as discussed above, this project is really an infill location between two cities directly south of Mather at Independence and west of the New Bridge and Mather South projects. There are significant jobs within five miles. Uh, the job centers such as uh, Rancho Cordova, Mather, and the in Innovations um, Center or Technology uh, zone in the city of Sacramento to the west. And the project or the um, Jackson Township is also 10 miles away from the city core of the city of Sacramento. Next slide, please. So, smart growth design is a key component of the 2011 general plan update. And as Todd, Todd indicated, Projects moving the UPA must meet certain smart growth design factors, and Jackson Township does this. Um, I'm going to just highlight a couple of these, and you're going to get tired of me saying 10.6 uh, units per acre uh, density. Um, 
jobs housing balance between 0.9 and 1. So within the project, there's a, a balance of housing and jobs. Um, Todd mentioned the connections to existing and future developments with our trails and roads and transit. Um, and then 260 acres of HCP preserved within the plan boundaries and pet and transit orientation with over 12 miles of trails. Uh, next slide, please. And these next few slides are just kind of examples of uh, the smart growth here. This shows the um, housing within a quarter mile of walking distance to schools and parks. The majority of the, the project is within a quarter mile of those, those features. Next slide, please. You already saw the bikeway master plan and again, the 12 miles of trails. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our greenway that goes through the middle of the project and combines uh, the drainage system and a regional uh, bike trail that goes across the middle and connects between the West Jackson plan and the New Bridge plan. And then next slide, please. Finally, the town center, which shows a mix of uses, including housing and retail, as well as a transit center. And speaking of transit, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so part of Jackson Township uh, is an enhanced transit program. Uh, the Jackson Township team has worked hard with the RT staff to develop this program. It went before the RT board and about two to three years ago. Um, and it's not just a shuttle or a bus to connect to light rail. This program sets up an annual assessment program from the start that funds annual passes for residents and employees that can be used on the entire RT system. It ultimately provides for a bus line through Rosemont to the Manlove light rail station, the cost of which is covered by the annual assessment. And as Todd mentioned, it will have a 15 minute peak and uh, 30 minute non-peak hour headway. Um, the program also includes a transportation management association and the services provided by that. Next slide, please. So last but not least, our actual greenhouse gas reduction measures, which I am highlighting a few of these. Um, as you're aware, uh, in these new uh, planning areas, there will be no natural gas, which is a big reduction. Um, Cal Green Tier 2 standards will be applied, and they will be the standards that are in place at the time of MAP approval. The project includes in its greenhouse gas reduction plan um, electric vehicle infrastructure, including in the low and medium density, 100% um, uh, uh, plug uh, ready. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right term, but anyway, the, the infrastructure to plug in your electric vehicle. High density will have 10%. And then we have in public parking throughout the community uh, committed to 690 uh, plug-in stations. Um, the line is there because there's a number of measures that were not calculated into our um, environmental document as far as reductions, and that's the elimination of current uses within the plan area, including grazing, the raceway, um, and uh, other operations that are out there. So that we did not subtract those out in the original environmental document. Um, tree planting, we anticipate over 20,000 trees being planted through the landscape corridors as well as at the residence and in the parks. Um, and then there will be a total of over 1,130 acres preserved in open space for sequestration um, as well as mitigation uh, pursuant to the HCP 
And finally, uh, this project's conditioned on the implementation, implementation of CAP measures uh, to meet the CAP standards, and that would include um, any infill fee that the, the county so adopts through our ordinance. Next slide, please. So I have one more key point, and that's that the, the project before you now is alternative to, it was modified uh, because the HCP was adopted and um, it provides for 260 acres of on-site preserve, um, which connects with the Mather Preserve and the New Bridge Preserve. Uh, next slide, please. And this is another depiction of how it's consistent with the HCP. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, Jackson Township is integrated part of the larger Jackson corridor. Um, the projects to the east are intricately tied to the projects to the west. Uh, the two major Issues uh, facing the county are housing and climate change, and both are addressed by Jackson Township. Uh, Jackson Township brings a mix of 5,690 units with an average density, again, of 10.6 units per acre. Um, greenhouse gas is addressed through location, smart growth design, and reduction measures, and uh, an enhanced uh, transportation per, or transit program. The project's consistent with this South Sacramento HCP, and um, we will be having additional environmental analysis done to address the comments that were provided earlier. Um, and with that, I will now try and uh, address, I, I think uh, there were a few commissioner questions. Um, one with regard to the name, generally you have a specific plan that has a overall name and then as the subdivisions come in, they will have their own distinct names. And as uh, Todd indicated, uh, there's generally very little confusion on where um, uh, emergency vehicles are going because they also um, locate them through either the, the phone or through the cell phone. Um, with regard to the affordable housing uh, ordinance, uh, if the board adopts a ordinance that requires land dedication and fee, we will do that. We will be subject to whatever ordinance is uh, adopted when the maps are coming through. Um, and that's the same with the infill fee as I addressed earlier. Um, as far as the um, credits, there was a, some language change that we made and I think we're in a, um, agreement with the county at this point, uh, with the county staff at this point. Um, with that, uh, next slide, I think it's questions. I'd be happy to take any. Thank you, Mr. Wiley. I'm going to open it up to commissioner questions this evening. Sure, this is Kara. Um, <clears throat> and I'd like to also state for the record that I uh, met with the applicant, the applicant team. And that's kind of what my question um, is related to. We, we talked about um, sort of the changing nature of commercial and office zones and I thought it was really interesting worth bringing up um, tonight for the record some of your thoughts on um, how to adapt that space um, for changing needs of the community and then also just uh, the environment which we currently live and probably will for quite some time with the um, COVID pandemic and that's um, your thoughts on uh, office space and and what else could possibly um, um, be cited there? And uh, Commissioner, just clarification here: you're talking to along both the office and the the general commercial, or just the general correct, commercial? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, one of the um, 
concepts that Angela has put forward is a hospital use along Jackson Highway, and that would be allowed with the use permit in the office zone. Um, and certainly out in this area with the populations that they're growing, this would be an ideal location for medical services. Um, and general commercial, uh, there you can have a mix of many uses, including housing and in in those designations. Um, and uh, we're seeing some retail demand come back as uh, the uh, COVID is settling out, but um, that would be uses that would come a little bit later because usually you have to get rooftops out there. Obviously there's a need for um, a uh, grocery store out in this direction. You have Mather Independence right north of this, uh, a large um, community with no grocery store. And so this could easily serve that as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. I, I thought, um, you know, you don't necessarily think of uh, being zoned for um, office as being applicable to uh, medical services as well, though, um, makes sense. And I thought that was really interesting considering Sacramento is sort of a um, healthcare hub. Uh, and there's just such a changing dynamic of our workplace these days. I, I was really encouraged to hear that. So thank you for that. Great, thank you. Other commissioners with questions for the applicant this evening? Hi, this is Commissioner Borja. Um, the, the applicant uh, mentioned, uh, and also I would like to preface that uh, I did meet with the uh, applicant team as well as some stakeholders who have sent over comments regarding this project. Um, the applicant mentioned earlier that they are um, open to not postponing, but to also allow for the environmental documents completion for circulation um, uh, next next month or, or, or in two months in, in order for us to, to have a vote. Is that still, uh, I guess that's my question for both the applicant and to the county. Is that something that we have explored as a feasibility or as an option? so that commissioners could at least have a, an EIR that would be circulated? So uh, this is Jim Wiley. You do have an EIR that's been circulated. What would um, what generally occurs is uh, the planning commission recommends that the staff finalize that EIR and bring it forward to the, uh, and respond to all the, um, comments and bring that forward to the uh, board that we um, and so th that's the normal process uh, we all we wanted to indicate is we did have additional analysis going on and that would come out in the final EIR uh, at the time of the board and then public is then able to address any concerns that come out at the final uh, with the final EIR at the board um, Todd, you may want to address that as well. Yeah, I, I was just going to add that it's um, very rare for the Planning Commission to uh, have a final EIR, including all the responses to comments in front of them uh, for a project that goes on to the Board of Supervisors um, as the final hearing body. I can think of maybe, maybe one project in the 20 years I've worked here um it's it's like i said very rare typically the um commission's direction is to staff prepare the final eir including responses to comments um and then that is finalized and included uh and published before um uh, a minimum of 10 days before the board of supervisors uh hearing on the project which has not been set yet i uh, think Thank you for the response. Um, my next question um, is related to um, the, the comments on uh, 
guess there were some comments from the from some of the stakeholders about um, not necessarily environmental concerns, but how this uh, project would would also interact with with safety and perhaps any of the widening um, on on Highway 16. Um, can the applicant and or the, the county staff kind of just talk a little bit about that and um, see if we've been able to address both the, the safety and also the questions made by, uh, I want to say, the, the Highway Patrol back in 2019 or 2020? Sure, I can um, speak to a little bit to um, the transportation mitigation strategy. And I, I want to say, I think I see Matt Darrow with the Department of Transportation on the on the meeting as well. And so um, at a real high level, the, the transportation improvements would occur you know, would be triggered and, and identified and triggered for construction uh, as subsequent entitlements come forward, um, whether it's Jackson Road specifically or any of the other roads in the, in the community area. Um, I believe DOT would be uh, coordinating with uh, Caltrans uh, because Caltrans, uh, State Route 16 Jackson Road is currently a Caltrans facility. Um, and they would work to ensure that there's uh, safety for all users of the roadway network um, during construction of improvements. That could include, um, for example, rerouting uh, or detours or uh, things of that nature during the construction period. Um, the, the project or the transportation mitigation strategy also includes uh, installation of uh, facilities to address some of the rural roadways. Uh, in this part of the county, um, bringing some of those roadways up to the current standards, uh, ensuring that there's adequate shoulders, uh, things like that, that would help uh, improve safety uh, for the traveling public. Um, and Matt, if you can, if you have anything to add, feel free to go ahead. Yeah, I'll just do it because you called me out. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I'm here listening. And I think everything Todd said was 100% accurate. The only other thing I would add, and, and only because I'm, I'm not privy to the comment that, that we're addressing or is being asked about, I do know that Caltrans also has a project out there right now for Eagle's Nest and State Route 16 where they're going to address some existing safety issues in their mind. So um, that's the only thing I wanted to add. Everything Todd said was 100% accurate. And, and the commissioners may may remember that we did a workshop on the dynamic implementation tool and mitigation strategy, and, and Todd sort of addressed that. That's how we'll, we'll identify when and where um, transportation projects will um, need to occur. All I got. Thank, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Wong or Tatishi, do you have any questions for the applicant this evening? Not at this time. I, I think most everyone's asked questions that I was curious about. Uh, I will disclose that I did meet with the applicant. Um, <clears throat> I also met with the applicant and I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. Perfect. Well, I think my uh, questions were all answered when during the uh, applicant's response at the end of their presentation. I did meet with the applicant uh, also and just wanted to disclose that. Uh, with that, I think we're going to be wrapping up with the time for applicant uh, questions and we will move on to open the public comment. And there are no public comments at this time. Okay, we have no public comments. We're going to go ahead and close the public comment period. And we will move on to Commissioner Deliberation or a motion. This is Commissioner Tatishi. I would move staff recommendation. Uh, this is Commissioner Rathel. I'll second staff recommendation. Okay, thank you. And for the roll call vote, Commissioner Sporha. Yes. Martinson? Yes. Tatishi? Yes. Wong? Yes. And Rachel? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously.
right, congratulations. Thank you. That concludes item number four this evening. Uh, we'll move on to the planning director's report. Uh, this is Leanne Moffat, the county planning director, checking that you can hear me all right. Yes, Leanne. Thank you. So just a couple items to keep you uh, aware of what's headed uh, to the board. Um, some things that you have seen in the past. Uh, so OE3, the operating engineers, is at the board tomorrow. Um, we also brought forward to you a uh, the workshop on the housing trust fund. So that is at the board on Wednesday. Um, and then finally, next week, um, we are taking a package of county code amendments on recent state legislation called SB9 forward to the board. Um, that item um, is only a county code amendment package, so it doesn't come in front of the Planning Commission, uh, but we wanted to verbally let you know about that. Um, and uh, it does have to do with making sure that we are compliant with state law by January 1st uh, around allowing administrative two lot lot splits or two homes on one lot. And it could be that the board may want uh, zoning code amendments that would come back through the Planning Commission. So that's one of the questions we'll be asking the board. Um, and then my fourth item uh, is to let you know that we may need to come back to the Planning Commission on an expedited basis uh, to deal with some changes to the housing element to address comments by State HCD. So uh, stay tuned for more on that. And uh, we will appreciate your attention to this expedited matter when and if we get it back in front of the Planning Commission. So that's our my report for tonight. Thanks, Leanne. We'll move on to no, item number six. So this is uh, uh, Chris Paholi, Principal Planner. Just wanted to mention under this uh, miscellaneous scheduling items that um, in follow up to uh, Chair Rathel's request at the last meeting. Uh, regarding a joint pub or joint hearing of the uh, official planning bodies uh, of the county, uh, I did follow up uh, with him this afternoon and discussed it. Uh, we are going to be working together to um, try to uh, find a date and a um, uh, develop a scope of the uh, hearing, likely to happen sometime. Uh, early 2022. So I uh, wanted to mention that to the group, uh, as well as uh, letting you know that the uh, December 13th uh, Planning Commission meeting will be canceled. So the next uh, next meeting will occur in January. That's all that I have. Thank you, Chris. And item number seven. And there are no further public comments. All right, with that, we're going to adjourn at 7.54 p.m. Thank you all for your participation this evening, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.